Welcome to another episode of the Hat Collecting Talk Show, the show where we talk about the many different metaphorical hats that people wear in their lives, because no one does just one thing and everyone has a story. And on this show, you get to hear those stories. Uh, I am your host, Lacey Artemis, a creative Jill of many hats, and I am joined today by Mallory McGrath, who is the founder and CEO of Vive Planning, a litigation law clerk, a trained classical singer, a mom, a wife, and an amateur paleo baker. Mallory's pronouns are she and her. Welcome to the show, Mallory. Thank you so much for having me, Lacey. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, no, we've had uh, we've had a little bit of uh, pre-show chat, and it's uh, it's mm-hmm. been quite fun. And uh, so, yeah. I, I yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to getting into this as well. Yeah. Um, so the the icebreaker question that I start with on this show: Where did you grow up? So I grew up in a small town uh, about an hour northeast of Toronto called Port Perry in Ontario. For people that I have on the show who did not grow up uh, here in Toronto, because we had a lot mm-hmm. of Toronto guests. I've also been asking, um, do you think that there's any lasting influence that uh, the place that you grew up has had on you that that uh, kind of persists to today? Wow, that's that's a really good, profound question you just asked. Um, I would say yes. I mean, I my husband and I currently are actually looking to move out of the city. We're actively looking. And it's something we'd always long-term planned on, so it's not out of the blue. But you know, a lot of people say, why are you leaving? Like your work's here, everything's here. But when you're raised in a small town, I think you go either one of two ways. You either want to get the heck out of Dodge and not come back. Or you get to a point in your life and realize the beauty of being raised where there's space, where you know people. And it can get annoying when everybody knows you. But just the idea that you can be even just in a nice community and development where everyone knows you, knows your kids, you have this comfort level with each other, you walk into the grocery store and say hi to six people within the first 10 minutes, right? I I actually, I really did like that growing up, but felt like, um, like I should want to go away, like I should want to go and, you know, find who I am and everything. And I'm grateful the path that I took, but I'm also very happy to be moving back, not to Port Perry, but to like kind of halfway in between. I think that's going to be a lot better for me as a person, but also me with my whole family. Yeah, with that said, I'm going to take a moment to do our brief land acknowledgement. Um, Toronto, or Tecoronto, is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabe. This is a Dish With One Spoon Treaty territory, and we are uninvited visitors on this land. You can find out more about that at native-land.ca, and despite that being a .ca, it actually covers the whole world and not just Canada, and so that's a good place to get started, but not where you should end your learning journey. Um, yeah, I think you had mentioned that you uh, you knew a little bit, or you, you were going to do a bit of research about uh, yours as well. <laughs> yeah, I did actually. I so I grew up in Port Perry, which is a part of the township of Scugog, and I grew up knowing that the Bagwading community lived on, resided on the island and had land there, and they also have a charity casino called the Blue Heron Charity Casino. So I knew that they were there, and so when you asked me that question, I'm like, oh yeah, it's the Bagwading community, and then I mentioned it to my husband, and he's like, well is that he's like he's like oh he's like i feel really ignorant is is that their is that like their specific name for their 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 tribe or just the the group of them there or are they part of like a bigger a bigger circle of of original settlers so i did do research so that i could say this answer so i'm going to read it so that i'm right so the mississaugas of scugog island first nation first resided and came to lake scugog in the year 1700 which I so did not know. How amazing is that? And so then the Bagwading Community Association was founded, uh, uh, I forget what year it was now, I didn't write that down, but more so I believe within our or our parents' life, more like our parents' or grandparents' lifetime. And so they created uh, the, the the charity organization that they have out there. And actually I've been lucky enough uh, twice now in my life to receive funds from them. Um, so they give back to their community. They helped me to go and study in New York City at one point, like really, really remarkable, uh, remarkable group of people and organization that they've created there. So I feel very lucky to have been able to live there and uh, be amongst uh, them and their in- wonderful influence. 
Very cool. Well, uh, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so in the introduction, I mentioned uh, that several of the things that, that you do or have done. <laughs> um, do you want to take a minute to kind of tell us a little bit about how you got into those things? Or oh, sorry, sure. whichever, one, whichever ones you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Well, I met a guy when I was 11 and I married him. Um, so that's how I became a wife. <laughs> um, and I had a baby five, almost five and a half years ago now. She's a little spitball of fire and was helping my husband clean windows when I left. How adorable is that? Um, and the paleo baker, that that's, uh, I went paleo about four years ago. So I love I loved baking and now still do, but had to kind of learn how to how to attack that beast that is baking without gluten. <laughs> um, but I think I've become quite good at it. Um, what else was on there? I think I mentioned that I had been trained as a classical singer. So I uh, was a singer my whole life. And at the time that I was ready to go to university, you couldn't study music theater and get a university level degree. And that was really important to me. And I think really important to my parents considering they're both teachers. So I, found out that I could sing classically and it was never my favorite thing to do, but it meant that I could sing and get a degree at the same time. So I went to McGill University and studied classical voice there. And then I went on and studied in New York City at the Banff Center for the Performing Arts um, and started to more so cultivate the music theater sound that I now more so use. Um, and yeah, so now I don't sing professionally at all anymore. I'll get hired here or there for, you know, a wedding, sometimes a funeral, things like that. But, um, singing is a, was a huge, is a huge part of who I am and, and my identity. Um, and then I guess the first thing you mentioned was my company, Vive Planning. So I founded Vive, um, we launched in November of 2020, but it's a brainchild from about three years ago that has been growing and developing. Um, and we work collaboratively with uh, clients and their families to plan for the aging and end of life process. We saw a niche in the traditional estate planning market and recognized that even though people might get their last will and testament, have powers of attorney, you know, have an accountant, a financial advisor, make sure they got all their money in order to live a super long life. We don't really communicate our wishes around aging and end of life with our loved ones. Um, it's a very North American way of doing planning, which is, you know, you find out what's in my will after I die, and that's the end. And um, people think that having these legal documents in place means that everything's okay and that their assets are safe. But really what they don't realize is they could be setting their family up for jealousy, greed, misunderstanding, and possibly litigation. So we try to advocate for those conversations happening with families and help families to plan in a much more holistic way. And yeah, that, that's really great. And I think um, the one that you don't think you covered was the, the litigation law clerk part. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I worked as a litigation law clerk for about a decade. It kind of came out of nowhere. This this It wasn't really a job. It was a career that, that happened upon me. I was in a community theater show um, with a man named Arnold Zweig and we hit it off and he told me about this trial he had coming up and that he had to hire uh, a law clerk to help him with it. It was just for six weeks. And I said, well, I'll do it. And at the time I was a struggling singer making minimum wage. So I'm like, sure. Like, I mean, I'm super organized. I don't need to know the law to really do what he was asking, which was a lot of organization, a lot of document, you know, understanding and sharing with him. So I came on for what was supposed to be a six week contract and worked for him for a decade. So my my whole life trajectory changed when I met him um, and essentially then led me to founding this company, Vive Planning. So without that conversation with him, actually, I met him, we were just chatting the other day. I met him 10 years ago this summer. Without that conversation, I wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't be where I am today. That That is, those are the sorts of things that I love kind of having come up on this show. Um, Cause like I can, I can think of several different milestones in my own journey that like, well, if this had gone differently or that hadn't happened and it's just, it's interesting to be like, Oh, where, where did we end up? And just appreciating what, what it is and, and, and whatnot. Um, 
So yeah, I guess this might be a bit tricky. I guess maybe we'll pick like three of those things because I like to ask about <laughs> misconceptions. What would you say, maybe, I guess we'll start with the main thing. What would you say is the biggest misconception that people, well, I guess you kind of covered it, but is there another misconception about like the end of life planning process that you want to address? I think a lot of times people think that talking about aging or death or end of life is depressing. And yeah, for some people, it, it might be. I mean, especially if you've just been given a diagnosis where you realize your life's about to end. And But what I find interesting, the more and more research I do, the more and more people I speak to who've been with a loved one at the end of their life, where say it's been a long illness, is there are stages that people go through. And, you know, a lot of people end up passing away very at peace and not depressed as we would naturally assume that they would be because their life is ending. And so I think a lot of times a big misconception, I think even amongst my own circle of really close friends and family is Mallory's so interested in, in the aging process and getting old and in death that I must be in some like little hollow depressed and and so upset and what really I think it is is it's an acknowledgement of a 100% reality <laughs> um, you know a statistic I say in interviews a lot is 100% of us are going to die and we're not going to be able to ever negate well I mean, who knows, but right now we are not going to be able to negate that statistic, right? And I think it's really just an acknowledgement of a life process. And if you have the ability to choose certain, as you said, milestones in your life, right? What that aging process is going to look like when you move, when you go to a home, how you die, if you get that choice. And I say lucky to have that choice, because I think being able to have the time to say goodbye is a big gift. Um, I think those are things to be able to talk about. And I don't think it makes me morbid or depressed. I think it makes me realistic and trying to bring some light and levity to the conversation. What in terms of like litigation and, and law work, um, what would you say maybe you think is the is a big, big misconception there? any lawyer listening to this is going to roll over and be annoyed with it. But I think that especially in, in litigation, I don't really know the roles of law clerks and non litigation work. So I can't really speak for that. But in litigation, obviously, lawyers are incredibly important, and I'm not diminishing their role. I think that our role as law clerks in the litigation process is greatly diminished. And a lot of times we're doing like a lot of the work and then obviously being reviewed by the lawyer because that's their job um and no credits really ever given when we're doing so much of it um i mean for instance when my when my employer had to do a um do like an examination for discovery like it was me who talked to the client it was me who gathered everything and then we would usually work collectively to build the questions right or to prep the client but sometimes i did a lot of that and so there is sometimes this misconception that we're really just paper pushers or we're legal assistants which is a completely different job um but we do a lot we we know these cases inside and out the same way that the lawyer does we just didn't go to law school which is an important thing um and we didn't and that's okay um but i don't think that makes us less than i think it makes us equal to and different in what we do in in my um I want to say limited, but somewhat limited experience uh, back when I used to be um, uh, earlier in my in my kind of career as as like an administrative um, type worker. Mm -hmm. uh, just I'm drawing on how you were kind of like zeroing in on the clerk part, and I do remember like administrative clerk or like accounting clerks, and that was really what it kind of came down to. It's like that's it, the grunt work, and mm -hmm. it's kind of where you got to start and kind of pay your dues in in, in that sense, and so. I, I definitely hear you on that. Uh, and, I, and I bet that there's probably some, hopefully there's some other clerks out there listening who'd be like, yeah, you, you, you tell it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet you there are. I bet you there are. It's always a fun phone call when you're, when you call a clerk who's on the other side of a litigation to like just deal with some administrative thing or some organizational thing. And then you both like lose your minds over your bosses or over clients. And, and you can have that sort of camaraderie. Um, I always like when that happens 
because then it shows a lot of times you forget that the lawyers and the clerks are humans, right? It's because they're doing this job in this very intense, effective way. And so you forget that they're just people who have to go home to their, you know, families and dogs and, and deal with crap like you do. So it's always nice to have that bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, I guess kind of two other options here. Um, because admittedly, I'm curious uh, to hear what you might think is a is a misconception about like being a classical singer. Um, but also, I didn't thought you, you seem to be pretty passionate about the paleo baking. So I wanted to give you an opportunity <laughs> to to talk about that one as well, if you want to. I don't know what a misconception. Oh well, I guess a misconception that paleo baking just wouldn't be tasty. Like I think that's that's a big misconception. A lot of paleo baking doesn't use like white sugar or brown sugar. It will use either maple syrup or coconut sugar to sweeten things, which is like a thousand times healthier, first of all, but healthy doesn't mean not tasty. I am a sugar addicted human being. So I know <laughs> I'm not sitting there eating carrots as my bedtime snack. I promise you that. So um, yeah, I think that's a big misconception that it won't be tasty. It might be different. The flavoring might be different because you're using nut flours that have flavor as opposed to like white traditional flour, which doesn't. Um, so yeah, that would probably be the biggest misconception with that. And then I guess in terms of being a classical singer, well, I mean, the obvious one that we're divas, um, because the word diva is associated with an opera singer a lot, like uh, originally with opera singers, you know, the diva is about to arrive. And that word meant, you know, the lead, the female lead, but now it has this negative connotation. Um, and, you know, if ever I'm speaking about being a singer, sometimes I'll speak to, to students at high schools about it. And um, I... I always say there's nothing wrong with having an ego. There's nothing wrong with knowing that you're good. It's wrong if you share it with absolutely everyone around you, but to get up on the stage and bear your soul and share your voice, you have to believe that you're good at what you're doing. You can't not, otherwise you will make mistakes. And it's all about that mentality. So have an ego, but don't act like a diva, I think is the important thing. And unfortunately it all just gets grouped together that all performers, not necessarily just classically trained singers, but that we have, because we have these boisterous personalities and we're, we're very vocal as singers and, and speaking, that therefore we're egotistical, but we're not. Some of us are, but most of us aren't. <laughs> I, I like how you said in those two things, you said uh, tasty or healthy doesn't have to mean not tasty. And you said, mm -hmm. have an ego, but don't be I forget, don't act like, a diva. Yeah, don't and, like a diva. Yeah. And, and, and I like those kinds of juxtapositions. So <laughs> thank you. for. There that. you go. We need to make some memes or something to go with that. I think those are some good quotes from me. <laughs> yeah. The, the next question here. Um, We've kind of been covering, I guess, sort of the, the past. We're going to go way back now. Um, mm -hmm. When when you were a child, do you remember what you wanted to be or to do when you grew up? I did want to be a performer. I would sing, you know, like you see in movies all the time, with a hairbrush in front of a mirror. That's totally normal. However, <laughs> I would also do something else. And this is where, when I tell this story, you actually see the two little, two very separate lives I've had come together. I would be in my room having music blaring, like pretending that I'm singing, you know, or pretending I'm winning an Academy Award or something like that, right? And then I would start to purge and organize my room. And it would usually go in succession like that, where all of a sudden it's like I got my creative out and now I have to just like create order. And I would, yeah, I purged to this day. I was purging before I came here. I'm not even kidding, literally was. And and I like to keep things organized and clean. And I like to know that things are in order. And I think that's kind of funny because I became a singer and then a law clerk. <laughs> and I just basically embodied those two things. For a long time, like when I was in university, even studying voice, I thought, okay, if I can't make it as a singer, I'll become like an executive assistant to some CEO somewhere so I also think it's just I mean I kind of in a way did that being a law clerk being this right hand to this lawyer for a decade but then I took the next step that I never expected and became the CEO myself I can very much relate to that uh, as, as both someone with a very strong creative side but then also uh, a very organized side as well and like you know my my day job is in organizing things basically mm -hmm. and i have to do a lot of that for this project as well because i'm right. the, doing everything myself so mm -hmm. um i can definitely and i think that i for me i i need both both sides i can't yeah. have only one or the other so i get that 
And I think a lot of times people think that very creative people are very like free and flowing and like they don't have these other sides to them. And and I think that's also why I didn't I, I didn't thrive in the professional world. I mean, yes, it could have been talent and that's fine, but I also think there has to be just like a a 100% mentality of success to be able to do that. And I wanted order in my life and you can't really want order and be a performer at the same time. I think that it, it starts to not work out, especially in the professional world. And I had to pick which side I was willing to, you know, walk away from. Um, and you can be creative and not get paid for it. So it was a easy choice for me at least. Yeah, I think uh, the the struggle that I'm thinking a lot about these days in, in terms of working towards becoming my own boss at some point mm -hmm. is then having to to create my own structure each day because mm -hmm. like, you know, if you have like a nine to five job, the structure is there. But when yeah. you're you're having to like, you know, do it yourself. So that's something I've been struggling a little bit with uh, within mm -hmm. the pandemic, but um, <laughs> starting to get a bit of a, a sense for it. Um, Good. But yeah, so the, the next question here, um, the show is kind of kind of was born a bit from from the idea that we're all supposed to have it, like most of our lives and things like our path and our trajectory figured out by the time that we're 30. But for a lot of people, that is not the case. And mm -hmm. so I used to ask, like, um, where where were you at at that age? But now I think the more interesting and the more telling question is, um, what age were you at when you first got on to again, assuming that the path that you're currently on, in your case, it kind of sounds like you're you're kind of happy with it and you want to stick with it for a while. And what age were you when you first got on to like your current path? I mean, you could consider being a lock like a part of the path. I think it led me to this path. I think it was the, the detour I needed to get there, the detour away from my creative self, uh, my singing self to get there. But I think this path being be working, creating, be planning and, and actively working it now, I think that I actually think that really there was a big turning point last like end of April, beginning of May for me. And this was already well in the works and we were supposed to launch in May and then didn't because COVID happened but we put everything on pause and, and there was a big change in how the company was going to run something happened that was very separate from COVID that really forced me to make a choice it was basically step up or or, or be done with it and I could have used COVID as an excuse to just sort of pull back everything I'd done and just go back to being a law clerk and be happy and happy and, and not and happy in more like a placated way right? Like, this is okay. You know, you start a company, you kind of have to give up everything else that you love for a while and just dive in. And are you ready to do this? And are you passionate enough about it to spend every waking moment learning about this thing, this topic for a while? And yes, there will come a time where you can have a bit more of a life again. And are you ready to do that? And this, 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 this occurrence that happened that really forced me to make that profound choice. But now I look back on it and go, thank God, like, thank God it happened. Because I, I always come across as a very confident person. But I think like the many hats we wear, you can come across one way and be freaking out on the inside in another way. And I'm just very good at masking, because I, I have an animated personality. What I've noticed in myself is the growth in the past year, the um, the calm I've instilled in myself, which is not something I'm good at either, where I'm just like, we're taking this one day at a time, we're just doing it as opposed to wanting to know how this is going to work out 10 years from now, right. And I think taking on something that is entirely your own, it's my neck all the time, it's my final say all the time, that causes you to really step up and make a huge choice. And I feel so grateful now that I was actually put in that uncomfortable position at the time to be able to make that choice. And now I feel like this is where I am. And that all happened, like I'm 34. And, and so this happened when I was 33. And when I was 30, I had just had a baby, I was working as a law clerk, and I was happy. But I'm a person that needs, I need things pushing me. And yeah, being a mom is a big thing. But I knew I wasn't only going to be a mother. I knew that I wanted to have a very personal success of my own that I could show to my daughter as well. And so yeah, you do not have it all together when you're 30. I don't know why we think that. And I remember thinking that in my 20s, right? Like we just think, oh, when you're 30, you're like grown up. Uh, no, you're not. You're not grown up at all. <laughs> 
I think maybe in part it it's like a holdover from like our parents' generation back mm -hmm. when you like, you know, would would you know college was kind of like free and you could afford to get like a house on like a part-time <laughs> job or something. I know. And so for our parents, their lives were a lot more set and stable mm -hmm. and kind of figured out by that point. And so yeah. now we have to, I think now for like our generation and future generations, it's probably going to be more like 40 would be where you'd be really getting to that point. Mm -hmm. And I'm just coming up on 40 and I am just feeling like, hey, I actually, mm -hmm. for the first time in my adult life, I actually feel like, okay, I know what I do want to keep doing going forward. Mm -hmm. And there will be some adjusting on, on the fly, but... Yeah. Um, you know, after after eight years of trying to figure out what do I want to do because this day job is not not what I want to do for the next 30 years. <laughs> yeah, but I like to kind of ask, what do you think would was the the biggest obstacle to you getting onto this path potentially sooner? Oh, it was definitely how I identified myself. So I identified myself as a singer. And I mean, I always say singing is the most personal expression of music. I mean, everything else has an instrument that you hold or put to your mouth or do whatever. Like it's, it's, it's different. Singing is you. There's, there's no, nothing you can blame anything on, right. But yourself as a singer. And I had a vocal hemorrhage of oh, however many years ago now it was like seven, eight years ago now. And that shattered my self identity because I couldn't sing. And for a chunk of time, I couldn't actually make a sound. I couldn't speak. It's not like getting laryngitis and losing your voice. Like my vocal cords would not vibrate. So that was really damaging. And that took time to heal. And I actually, I recorded an album years later. I started a, a company uh, just three years ago now, actually, that uh, kind of was like a company for two things. It helped me to um, learn how to run a company. <laughs> and it helped me to put vocal health out there as, a, as this taboo topic for singers that we needed to talk more about. And yeah, it really, it was hard for me to step away, even after the hemorrhage, even after I come to terms with it, I had healed, I had recorded this album, even after I'd done all those things to heal that, that trauma in my life, I still didn't know how to be, how to not be Mallory McGrath, the singer. Like, how do you stop being that? And I still sing, but it is not the number one thing on my list anymore that I identify with. And the biggest obstacle I think besides overcoming how you view yourself is at least for me is overcoming how everybody else views you. And that's been a big thing as I've been like, I mean, if you looked at my social media a year ago and now look at it now, <laughs> it's very different. I talk about hospice and palliative care. I talk about end of life and aging and you know, th that's a big thing. This all changed during a pandemic where my friends are like, what's going on? What's happening to her? Where's the like little happy musical thing she posted all the time. And that was big. I had to release that. I had to go, of course, you're always going to be a singer, Mallory. That's not going to stop. So you're going to do it the rest of your life, but it's not going to be my career. It's not going to be what I leave my mark on society with. So I had to release it as being this massive pop piece of the pie puzzle that is my identity and go, no, it is something that I do, something that I greatly enjoy, that it is not going to identify me anymore. And as soon as I figured that out, which happened again around this time last year, like I was talking about in the last question, I had to release that as well and go, no, this is what we're, what I'm choosing to be now. I'm choosing to be this advocate for families. And so I need to go down that path and have singing as a hobby and be okay with that. Yeah, I I can I can relate to that in in some of my own unique ways as is often mm -hmm. the case on this show. Um <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for that answer. Um, mm -hmm. I I really appreciate the the passion and the enthusiasm that that you have. Um, <laughs> Um, the next question here, and again, this is another kind of cultural narrative that I sort of like to push back against a bit on the show. There's this idea around the idea of or around the topic of self-care that um, a lot of people, I think, still think of it as like, oh, self-care is going to a spa or having like a really expensive <laughs> dinner or, you know, stuff like that. Like that has to be really pampering and like high, mm -hmm. high society kind of thing. But mm -hmm. self-care can be as simple as just buying yourself a candy bar because you want one or, you know, painting yes. your nails if that will make you a little happier. And mm -hmm. so um, I like to ask my guests, what is the last act of self-care that you did for yourself, no matter how small it was? Mm -hmm. 
I was really excited to make these pancakes this morning that I wanted, that I knew no one else would want, but I was out of eggs. So that would have been the thing today. <laughs> but what I did, not yesterday, but the day before, was I actually signed up for this two week prompted writing class. And it's uh, it's offered by this company called Being Here Human. And um, they teach grief literacy um, to specifically to the BIPOC, LGBTQ um, and disabled community um, who are greatly underrepresented in, in any sort of aging end of life grief scenarios. And so I took a course with them a week ago and, and one of the, the leaders mentioned this writing program to me. I was kind of like, okay, I, I mean, I speak very well. I don't think I write as well as I speak. But what was really interesting about it is it was specifically this, so you'll get like this email once a morning for two weeks that will prompt me to write about something. And it's specifically for people with chronic illnesses or who are disabled. And I suffer from a series of chronic illnesses that will impact the way that I age and progress through my own journey in life. And it's something that I've dealt with a lot in therapy and through the support of my family, but lately it's been weighing on me a lot. And so when this came along and you know we're saving money to buy this house and I just said to my husband, I, I have to sign up for this. Like, I'm sorry, it has to happen. And I'm, I think it was a really good example of self-care where I was like, you know what? A, I don't have time for this. B, I shouldn't spend the money, but holy crap, this just came across my desk in that sort of serendipitous way. I should really dive in and do this. And I think it will be very, uh, very enlightening for me to write about and then read back how I feel about these illnesses that greatly impact my life. Can, I can definitely see, I, I'm, I'm a person who does a lot of kind of journaling and I've mm -hmm. seen how that retrospective can be very, very enlightening uh, in mm -hmm. the future. Actually something, I'll just mention this for, for the audience and, and for you yeah. if you're not aware of it, there's a website called, I believe it's futureme.org okay. and you go there and you can write a letter to your future self and you can <gasps> choose whether you'll get it in a year, in two years, I think maybe six months, oh like 10 I'm years. seriously writing this down <laughs> as you keep talking about it. <laughs> yeah, actually let me just double check and make sure that that is the correct address, but I'm pretty sure. Futureme.org, oh my God, I so yep. wanna do that. That sounds yep. like such an interesting therapeutic tool. Wow. Yeah. And what I wow. used to do, I found this a few years ago. And so I would um, do it and I would set it for a year. And then when I would get that, cause it'll send you an email with whatever you mm -hmm. wrote and you can, you can just write your thoughts or you can ask your future self questions. And once I got it, I would read it and I would think about it. And then I would send myself a new one to get a year after that. Yeah. And I think that last year, I just, with the pandemic and with things going on, I just, I never got to actually sending the next one. So hmm. I'll have to go and do that eventually. But it, it was interesting because there was, there was things in my life where it was like, you know, I'd ask you to me, like, is this still a thing or is this person still whatever? Like, have you done this right. thing yet? Um, or whatever, whatever. And so it, it can definitely be, as you said, a therapeutic tool to kind of help you see your progress and mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, just kind of put things in context sometimes. Definitely. So. Yeah. Yeah. So any anyone who's listening who might be interested in that, I confirmed it is futureme.org. There's no spaces or dashes or anything there. The next question here on the show, I like to ask the guests because the show is largely about trying to learn from people's experiences. And so I like mm -hmm. to ask, what is the last new thing that you learned? And what is something that you would still like to learn, whether it's like a skill or a piece of information or something? The last new thing I learned was last week, I took this course, I just mentioned this grief literacy course, and I, and now I can't stop thinking this in my head, but I learned, uh, the, the person who gave the course compared end of life to birth and, and talked about how we as a society, um, and I hope I don't botch this if she watches this, but we as a society, you know, we talk, you know, especially fellow moms or fellow pregnant women will talk about, oh, you know, um, oh, it's just going to hurt, but like, whatever. It's like one day and you just get it done and you get a baby, right? Like that's all you got to get through. And um, so we go into, so if you're, if you're pregnant, carrying a baby and you feel pain, you don't freak out. You go, oh, that's normal. This is supposed to happen. And then you go about having a baby. But if we told women 
that there will be no pain. You'll just get flooded with endorphins and this beautiful baby will come out and everything will be wonderful. And then all of a sudden you felt pain. The first thing you do is pick up the phone and call the doctor because you would think something is wrong. So she tells that story about birth and then compares it to grief and loss. And we as a society say that grief is, you know, it's this painful process, but you'll go through these steps you know, and you'll get to the other side and you'll live your life fully, you know, remembering this person. And so then when we don't do that, when we don't follow these, you know, prescribed five steps, and when we don't follow them, all of a sudden we're looked at as having a complicated grieving process, that something is wrong, that we're depressed or anxious. But that's because we've said that it should just be a set number of days or a set amount of time before you can get out of bed, before you can put your clothes on and maybe start working a bit, before you can start dating again if you've lost someone that way, before you go and laugh at a movie, right? But really everyone is so fundamentally different that we're trapped in this way of viewing what grief should be. And that goes for death, but also for you know having a breakup or losing your job or having to move far away and missing your family. You're grieving that connection, right? So so it was just so interesting. Now, when I think about grief and loss, I'm constantly thinking about birth. There are these two fundamental parts of life that, yes, are in a way the complete opposite. A being enters the world, a being exits the world. But really, that's the, the juxtaposition and the ultimate journey of life. And so we should treat them in a similar way and say that, you know, yes, birth is going to hurt but it's totally worth it, right? And over here, grief is going to suck. And that's okay. And you can do what you have to do to grieve. Whatever you need to do to go through your personal grief process, that's 100% acceptable and you don't have to fit a mold. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you, did you cover the, the something that you'd still like to learn? I'm not sure. Oh, yes. I want to learn how to play the cello. <laughs> Completely <laughs> opposite. Too. Of really? So yes. My mom played cello in high school. And whenever I hear someone play the cello, I just like, I die a little. I'm just like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. If I had the time, which I don't right now, but hopefully one day, if I have the time and the money, like I really would love to learn to play cello, which is so beautiful. Yeah, the cello just has a very unique sound for, yes. for a stringed instrument. And yeah. there's like, I think the first time it really stood out to me, uh, there's a video game called Max Payne. Some of my listeners might be familiar with it. <laughs> the theme song features a uh, cello very prominently and it's just this haunting sound. Yes, and that's the word I use. <laughs> yeah, and, and just, I, I know it wouldn't be easy, but like I would love to, even just to like play one half decently one day. Okay. Lacey, maybe um, this is what you and I do. Maybe this is how our friendship continues. Maybe we learn to play cello together. I'm in it. <laughs> let's let's do it. Let's do it. Packed, we we'll make a pack, the nice. cello pack. So we're gonna cello. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you kind of answered this next question earlier on, but I'll see if maybe if you can come up with like maybe a different answer or maybe we'll just we'll just all reiterate that that yeah, sure. so I like to ask because in the sense of these these metaphorical hats, um, a lot of the things that like we we do, they we know that the connections between them, but to people externally, uh, they they may seem very like disparate or unrelated. And like earlier you did mention like the singing and like the law clerk, the organization stuff are very great. Is there any other examples of that in your life that you can think of, of sort of two things that you're interested in or that you do that maybe to other people or maybe even to yourself, you're just like, yeah, these are very different, but I like them both. I mean, I think being a mom is a big thing. I think we as a society think that when you're a mom, that that's, that's your life right? Even if you're a working mom, even, even, even now in our millennial generation, where I think, I mean, I don't have any statistic for this, but I'm going to assume it's more common that a mother is working in our generation than it was in previous, right? But I think there's this idea that you just drop everything. If I get a call from the school saying my daughter, you know, threw up, is it my job to drop absolutely everything and go there? Is it, can't my husband do that too? Like it's a phone call. We figure out who can handle it. Someone does it. But why is it, why do I get the phone call? <laughs> why do I get it automatically? And so for me, I always knew I wanted to be a mom. I always knew I wanted one kid or twins, but I was only given birth once <laughs> and I got the one and I'm very happy, but that's not it. Like I'm not just done. 
I'm not just going to work my job and give, you know, a thousand percent to my kid and that I'll be happy. I will be a version of happy, but not the complete version that I could be if I kept going beyond that. But I also am allowed to have ambitions of my own. I'm also allowed to be busy. I'm allowed to book her play dates and set aside time on the weekend for me to read up on the course I'm taking. I'm, I'm allowed to cook ferociously for my family as I do. And then also turn to my husband and say, I'm going to get a massage on Saturday morning. Bye. And like, that's okay to do as well. And I think there's still, unfortunately, which really is ridiculous because millennials are so, especially millennial women are so fiercely independent. Um, there's still such a, uh, a connotation that we should be everything for our children. And they, not always, but when they do have other parents, they can do things too, <laughs> and they should be. And we don't have to drop our lives. Um, we should find a way to complement being a parent, being a mother, and doing what brings us joy. And it's okay for something else to bring us joy besides the child slash children we've produced. Absolutely. Very well said. Thank you. <laughs> you are giving stellar answers. I, I think you're going to have a good answer for this one as well, based on how things have been going. Um, so the preface for this question is that there's a lot of things that we're, that are, you know, that are mandatory that we have to learn in school, like English, math, science. Mm -hmm. um, and we're told that these are skills, like obviously English is a skill, like we need to be able to like read and write to, to yeah. for the most part, to get through life. Um, yeah. or at least it's pretty significant, but, but math doesn't always come out as such a huge factor or even science potentially. But yeah. what I find interesting is hearing from people who, once they got out into the working world and they kind of got into a job and they, they picked up some skills specific from that job or just one of their hobbies maybe that had nothing to do with anything they studied in school. And then they get into a situation where they'll apply one of these skills in like a, an, a situation that it's not for or, or from. And so just kind of like, oh, hey, this, this skill I picked up is unexpectedly useful with this thing and yay. And so this is kind of an awkward way to ask this, but are there any skills that you've picked up since you got out of school that you've ended up using in unexpected ways or situations? Mm -hmm. There's a couple I can think of, but the one that stands out would be a lot of times when I'm meeting with clients or other industry professionals around V planning, they'll be like, how did an opera singer get here? And, you know, I mean, I guess you don't use anything from that life here, right? And um, I think that what makes me really good at my job when I'm working with families is the fact that I'm very empathetic. And I think that creative people ha are much, uh, for the most part, much more in tune with their emotions, much more able to tap into their emotions. And then also probably, especially if you're in the performing arts, you've learned how to verbally express emotion, whether you're doing it as a character or yourself. And so when I meet with uh, clients. I mean, what I think differentiates me from an emotional standpoint from traditional estate planning uh, providers like lawyers, accountants, financial advisors is I talk about my life. I, I, I tell them, you know, if they're sitting there and they're, you know, say they're a blended family and, and they're just they're concerned about how to handle things. I talk about my blended family. I have four parents. I've got a sister from the same marriage I was from and two brothers from a second marriage. And we're all good, we're all happy, but that's not gonna be like that forever. And so, possibly, right, things could go haywire. Even in a little, you know, traditional nuclear family, things go haywire. So I try to like just share my own experiences. I mean, I think that makes me appear more human. Yes, these people are paying me to do something for them, but that doesn't put me up on a pedestal. That doesn't make me superior to them in some way, just because I understand this process a bit better than them. Each of them have a skill that I probably don't understand. So, you know, one day maybe I'm going to hire them to do something for me. Like we're just, we, we should view ourselves more as equal. Being tapping into those emotions, being really confident speaking publicly as well. That's a skill set that transfers. And there are many CEOs out there who all watch publicly speak. And I'm like, that that's what they're missing. They might be brilliant. They may have had the best idea ever. They might be much better business men or women than I am. But public speaking is a thing that you need to be able to do if you're the face of an organization. And I think that everything I learned at McGill as an opera singer has prepared me to lead a company and change the way people view the planning process. 
I you you're so right about the the public speaking thing. That is something that quite honestly, I was very shy and socially awkward as a kid and mm. I it wasn't until kind of like my mid 20s really that I I realized like I am missing out on so so many opportunities of like just yeah. even just like friend connections and like dating mm -hmm. terms and jobs like because I just wasn't a strong confident speaker and mm -hmm. I didn't go take like a class on it or anything I literally just had to push myself like uh, day by day uh, uh, opportunity by opportunity to mm -hmm. to to talk more and you know, now like people often think that I'm an extrovert and I'm really not. I just have gotten so much, <laughs> it's taken a decade, but I've gotten yeah. so much more comfortable. And, and I can now tell how being a confident speaker, uh, just being able to go up to strangers in public and just be like, you know, just say something to them or ask them mm -hmm. a question. It, it unlocks so many possibilities. And so that's something for all you shy people, all you introverts out there. Um, just just add a little bit more of that to your repertoire and mm -hmm. you will notice a difference, I think. And I think just um, like when you were mentioning the subjects in school, I thought where that question was going a different way, a slightly different way, and that's okay. But I, I think something we lack in our education is helping children to learn how to publicly speak. And I can remember giving presentations and knowing that that girl over there, her, her presentation is a thousand times better than mine, but I'm going to be able to sell it so much better than she can. And that's unfair. Like I know I got away with a lot of really good grades, mostly because I'm animated, because I make things sound interesting. Um, but I probably didn't do as good of a job as three other people <laughs> who, who just maybe don't have that skill set. And that's something I think we should be teaching our children is you don't have to be an extrovert, that's what I'm saying, but you should be able to carry on a conversation with someone, hopefully without complete panic setting in. And that does come from practice, right? Anything that causes you that causes you fear, anxiety, you know, you desensitize yourself to it by doing it a little bit, not like huge, but a little bit over and over again, and eventually, hopefully get comfortable. And I would hope that that's something we could start doing more is helping our children to feel confident, you know, standing up for what they're talking about and sharing it with others. Um, I think there's far too many shy or introverted people that are just freaking brilliant and we just don't know it because they just don't have that particular skill set to get it out there yeah and part of that like uh it, i think comes from like you know we, we could teach that in school but I, I think you also obviously get a big advantage if your parents are more um strong mm -hmm. confident speakers uh like i yeah. know a few of my friends like um, but what I was what I was going to say, I wanted to just sort of clarify when I say add a little bit of that to your repertoire. I'm not suggesting that everyone should like strive to become like a keynote speaker. I mean, oh, even no. <laughs> if you just like add like 10 percent more confidence, 10 percent more comfort with speaking, mm -hmm. like just not to maybe just to people that you don't know or you're not already comfortable with just just that little extra. And like I said, you will notice a difference. And the more mm -hmm. you do it, the easier it gets. So it, it it's like a snowball. Um, Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so we're going to uh, move on to the next section of the show here. We're going to a little bit more serious now, um, mm -hmm. just for a few questions anyways. Okay. Um, so I like to talk about uh, close relationships on the show because they, as I was just saying, they matter in terms of, you know, like giving us a leg up in certain cases. Uh, if you have a lot of supportive people around you, it's certainly going to help you kind of get further faster than if you maybe are unfortunately... Um, you know, your roll of the dice puts you with uh, with more perhaps like um, toxic, abusive people or unsupportive people or people with just not maybe the best emotional intelligence. And so I've come with this concept of hype hats and heavy hats. And hype hats <laughs> are people who hype you up and, and try to encourage yeah. you and try to help you, um, you know, believe in yourself. And heavy hats are the people that kind of weigh you down and make you doubt yourself and, and that sort of thing. And so you don't have to give specific names or examples if you don't want to, but um, can you kind of think, and the goal of this is to, to ultimately to teach the audience if they don't already know how to identify the signs of how to identify these types of people. Um, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, is there someone, uh, or if you can just give like examples uh, for you of, of like a hype hat and a heavy hat from your life. Hype hats, I'm lucky. There are a lot. So I'll talk about someone who recently, and I'll, I'll say her name and I'll tell her to watch this. It'll probably make her very happy. But um, her name's Catherine Haru. And I met her, 
in like uh, September of 2019. Yeah. And so she was introduced to me as an option of a marketing strategist for my company. And um, I had already hired the branding company and they're like, what about this woman here? And she has now become such an invaluable friend to me. Um, obviously, she's a huge part of Eve. And, and when people give me credit for speaking well, I go, yeah, well, I'll give it to Catherine. <laughs> she She's the one who taught me everything. But she I don't think I had really anyone who just just single single mindedly believed in this company the way she did. And like I include all my family in that really. She was just like, this is brilliant. We're just doing it and has just been a thousand percent there. And whenever I have a day of self-doubt, which of course happens to all of us, and when you're a CEO, it happens sometimes daily. Um, she's the person that I, you know, text and go, This is what I'm thinking. And she'll say no just no, just stop. It's not, you're just, you're just in your head. Just let it go, move on. Or she'll say, yep, that's, that's a cause for concern. Here's what we can do. Or you're right. Okay. Now I have to think about it. Right. Like she's just constantly on board for making both my company and me a success. So she is totally my hype person. Hi, Catherine. Um, <laughs> and then in what was the, what was the name of the, the other type? Sorry. The heavy hat heavy hat that's good i like that oh i mean i you know something i was saying the other day i was talking with a friend who's another awesome hype friend um if we had time i would name them all but i was talking with her about how i feel like the pandemic was very eye-opening at least for me from the perspective of who's really one of your good friends and who just isn't not necessarily that they're not a friend but they're not like you know they're not the top shelf, right? Like, I mean, that, and for me, it came down to uh, everyone reacted differently during these past 15 months. I was starting a company, so I didn't have time to really worry about not having a social life because I wouldn't have had one anyways, whether there'd been a pandemic happening or not. So for me, I, my husband and I and daughter, we were lucky enough to really, we, we did well. We did well during these 15 months and we were really lucky. And I, I acknowledge that this has just been a horrible time for so many people. I think the thing that I learned was there are people that despite everything that's going on can at least acknowledge your presence who can, even if it's a, I'm so busy, I have no time to talk to you, but I love you. Like that sentence to me is a perfectly acceptable thing to say because we all have lives. I don't expect people to get on the phone and talk to me for an hour whenever I want. I don't have time for that for a lot of my friends unless it were a real emergency. So I get that. But it really became clear to me that there were a lot of people in my life that I personally felt were like, you know, I don't want to use a hierarchy, but so much higher up, so much had so much importance to me as friends. And what I realized in this past year is, oh, there's a lot of them that I'm not that to them. And I had to decide, A, does that matter? Like, is that okay that I'm not that high up in their world? Does that matter to me? And in some cases it didn't because you know what? I get a lot from them when we're together, so whatever, that's good. But there were a lot of friends where I just went, hi, get, do you get what I just did this year? I just founded a company and you should at least pick up the phone or text or Facebook message, whatever your mode of communication and say congrats and acknowledge what's happened. Ask a few questions, you know, like there's a way to be polite. There's a way to acknowledge who your friends are and, and that was a big thing for me this year is I was like, there are a lot of heavy hats in my life that are just not, you know what? And they're probably hype hats for someone else. They probably are, but they're not for me. And they're not even mid-level. They're, they are, they're heavy hats. And so I had to make some choices to just stop chasing, stop trying to actively keep them in my life because I wasn't important enough to them to do that. And that is a huge weight on me. That's one of my big things is I want people to like me. And so then when I don't get the same enthusiastic reception that I'm giving them, I have to deal with that and process that and figure out how I feel. And so some, some, yeah, they're still here. They're still in my life. I still am the active friend, shall we say, who's very getting us together, organizing it all. And that's okay. And and that's who also just who I am. I'm going to be that friend in a group of people. But then there's some where I just went, you know what? It's not worth it. It isn't. They don't make me happy enough to put so much into it. And so 
you let the natural progression happen of growing apart. You just allow it to happen. I really appreciate the the context that you gave there when you said that they're they're not they're not a heavy hat to someone else, but they are to yeah. me. And mm -hmm. I think that's good because I normally kind of focus on just like more, you know, sort of like people that contribute to your life versus people who kind of take away from your life. But there is an mm -hmm. in-between of people who, like you said, they they're friends. They're they're not yeah. like they're not like trying to you know keep you down, but they're not, as you said, top shelf. And, yeah. and so I, I appreciate you. Uh, you're the first person that's kind of uh, made that distinction, and and I really I really like that because I I very much relate to that. I've been through mm -hmm. this pandemic as well. I've been like looking at my you know my Facebook friends list and like how many of these people do I like absolutely just like I would drop anything to to go hang out with them. And yeah. there's not nearly as many as I <laughs> wish that there was. And I'm like, really what do I not. do about this? <laughs> I um, know, I know. And, and now that like I, with this show as it's, you know, kind of growing and, and the other things that I'm doing, I'm getting into a space kind of like what it sounds like you and someone else I just spoke to earlier today, where I, I don't have enough people in my life who I feel like get it uh, in, in that certain way that just sometimes you just need someone who gets certain things yeah. so that you can, you can feel like my friends are supportive, but they don't, and they'll listen and they'll be like, you know, that sounds tough, but someone who actually gets it can be really invaluable in a special way. And so mm -hmm. I'm now starting to realize like I'm getting into that zone where like, I need to know more like other entrepreneurial people who kind of get mm -hmm. that. So yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it sounds like, oh, and uh, from what you described of, of Catherine, like, I think I should get in touch with her. <laughs> oh, she is just from a marketing perspective. Yeah. She's a gem. She's an absolute gem. So I, I, I'm giving you, we're going to connect. We're going to connect you with her. She's wonderful. Awesome. Um, yeah. So the next question here. Um, so I'd like to, obviously the pandemic has affected us all, uh, some more than others and some more negatively than mm -hmm. others. Um, I think everyone, well, everyone does have a mental health. Some people are, have, you know, better mental health than others, but we all, everyone that I know has been impacted in their mental health for this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so um, whatever you're comfortable talking with, it can be sort of your whole life in general, or it can be kind of more recently, but I like to ask, um, have you dealt with any mental health struggles in your life and how have you worked through them? So yeah, I mentioned that I'm chronically ill. I also was injured three times, one of which was an assault. Being chronically ill, having been assaulted, I, basically being sick and injured since I was 14. So 20 years of my short life now. Uh, yeah, that comes with mental health issues. There's no way I think you get through it without it. Um, and so I've saw therapists and psychiatrists over the years. Um, I work with a mindset coach now. I feel like I went through so much therapy that I was kind of like, okay, I, don't, I know what's going to happen when I show up there. I know what they're going to say, how we're going to work through it. Like I, I went through cognitive behavioral therapy when I, after I'd been assaulted. So like, that's something I actively use a lot, even in small doses throughout like a normal day. So when I started to form this company, there's a lot of self doubt that comes with launching something. And I knew I needed I've always been really good at knowing when I need to talk to someone. Um, but I just knew I didn't want to go back into therapy. So I spoke with a friend of mine who's like, you should find like either a business coach or a mindset coach. And so I work with this wonderful woman who I swear just calms me thinking about her name. Her name's Amy Jeffries. And she is so great at helping me. Yes, from a business perspective is where we started. Um, just getting rid of a lot of that imposter syndrome and self doubt. But now I, I work with her a lot on working through what it's like to be chronically ill. I'm one of the issues I have is I have premature ovarian insufficiency. So I'm 34 years old and I'm actively going through perimenopause now. So I'll probably complete menopause before I'm 40, which for any of the listeners in the crowd that do not have, you know, a uh, ovaries. Um, if that's a, th that's not right. <laughs> that's not what's supposed to happen. Some women will start going through maybe having some symptoms in their late 30s. But usually it's, n it, it's more into your mid 40s when it begins to start. So that's been uh, a difficult journey to look at my peers, you know, I have two best friends trying to have babies right now. And I'm actually on the other end of that journey. Um, so yeah, that's been uh, this past two years since I was diagnosed, that's been my big 
That's my big thing is trying to figure out how to go through something that none of my peers can really understand. And, and also it's very taboo to talk about, even when women are say in their fifties, kind of all going through it together, they don't talk about it. And so finding a support network, finding friends who can just try to empathize, right. Is a, is a big struggle. Um, and it's definitely the thing, like if, if I, if I, you know, if you ask my husband, what's the big thing that weighs her down? It's, it, it is going through perimenopause. It is feeling out of control of my body. It's the weight gain. And I'm a person who cares about how she looks and how she comes across and having no control over your body. Uh, that's very upsetting. Um, so yeah, that's been my big, and it will continue to be, I don't think that it will go away. I think being chronically ill, it means that you're more likely to bring uh, to develop other illnesses. And so I'm very aware that I will on and off, not all the time, but on and off struggle with mental health issues. And I think that that makes sense. Uh, even if you weren't chronically ill or disabled, or we all go through things that are going to impact our mental health. And I actually saw someone on Instagram wearing a sweater the other day that said mental health is health right? Like, why, why are we calling it mental health, right? It should just be health, because it's your whole being. So I think that it's incredibly important for people to advocate that to talk about their journeys, if they can, some people can't yet. And that's okay. But I very openly talk about the assault that happened to me. I talk about my chronic illness, I talk about going through menopause at the age of 34. Because if I don't, then there's definitely people out there that wish they had heard someone say something and wish they'd had that I'm not alone feeling removed. And so I hope that by talking about my own health struggles, as well as mental health struggles, that that helps people to feel less alone. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's okay to struggle. As they say, it's okay to not be okay. Uh, it's exactly. not something you should be ashamed of. Um, mm -hmm. If you like, Hopefully you feel comfortable reaching out for help, even if it is just a friend or mm -hmm. and whether you can afford and, and will go to therapy. The next question is, is uh, I think it's probably a good one to kind of tie all of what we talked about so far together. Um, mm -hmm. So the premise is that failure can be a good thing. Um, I've given this spiel on the, on the show many times, but the, this idea that, you know, things that don't go the way that we might hope or that we're disappointed or maybe blindsided, but we, we, if you, the, the goal, is the, the, the important thing rather is to learn from it. And as long as we learn from things not going the way that we want or from, you know, failing, it's, mm -hmm. it's not, a, it's not a complete loss. And so I like to ask the guest what, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the pinnacle example, but can, can you think of an example in your life of a time that you, you quote unquote failed or something didn't go the way that you wanted it to, but you ultimately learned something valuable from that. And what was it? So many options. <laughs> well, I mean, one that comes to mind that I know my mom sometimes will bring up was when I was auditioning for universities to go to school, I really wanted to go to U of T. Um, it was known as one of the top two schools to study voice in Canada. And I didn't want to go super far away from home. I would have lived in the city, but I just didn't want to be too far away. And I really wanted to go there. And I auditioned at a bunch of other schools, including McGill, uh, which was the other really top school, and um, didn't get into U of T. I was waitlisted. They take like two or three Sopranos and they waitlist some others. And I auditioned at McGill and I get in. And I'm sitting there with my McGill acceptance and my waitlist letter. And I have to reply to the McGill acceptance one week before I'll find out if I'm getting into U of T or not. Being the very well behaved, organized type A firstborn that I am, I picked McGill, thankfully, because I did not get into U of T. Um, but I remember picking it, feeling like I was picking it because I had to pick it. <laughs> and I could have gone to some other schools that were closer by that I'd gotten into. But again, being the overachiever that I am, I went, well, no, like if I'm not getting into U of T, then I go to Miguel. Like that's what you do. Um, now I recognize that it's actually kind of very similar education across the board at a lot of schools. But at the time that was my mindset. And I remember going there and just like not 
like being excited because it's a big deal. I moved to Montreal and also kind of being like, like almost regretting that I wasn't at U of T, not that it was a choice. Um, and it took a while. It took a while for me to get over that. And now, especially as I look back, I mean, my time at McGill was so formative. Um, it being that far away from home, uh, especially being the homebody and being so connected to my parents as I am was actually very good <laughs> that I left. Um, it was good to get away. It was good to not be um, Carol Salomon and Royce Ryan McGrath's daughter. Like they're pretty well known in Durham region where I'm from. And so I was just their daughter, right? And you need to break out of the, whether your parents are well known or not, you're still these people's daughter and you or son. And you need to figure out a way to, be who you are. And so I think if I'd gone to U of T, it would have been a very different four years of school that and being at McGill taught me to really just having that independence, having to define who Mallory McGrath was and having to become known for who I was as well was really important. So I'm very glad I made the choice I didn't want to make because it was, yeah, it was definitely the path I was supposed to be on. Very cool. Yeah, it, that that's really what it comes down to sometimes is that, you know, having to to pick um, between sort of what seems like the the definitely like less desirable option, but you don't realize until after <laughs> the fact that it really was actually definitely the more desirable one for various yeah. reasons. We've kind of, I guess, indirectly come up with a lot of different like advice or, or food for thought for the audience so far, but I like to try and <laughs> To, to distill it down here and ask specifically. So I like to try and address, I think of, of society in sort of like three groups. There's like kind of the youth, there's the like the in-between and then there's the elders. And so I like to ask, and you can give the same piece of advice to each group if you want to, or you can give separate advice, but what advice would you give to a teen? What advice would you give to a 30 something? And what advice would you give to an elder or grandparent? Hmm. I'm going to do them backwards. I'm going to go from, yeah. So with any, I mean, it's funny you say grandparent. And I think of my parents who are grandparents and I don't think of them as elders, especially given the work that I do. Right. So I, I but you know, if I gave advice to, let's say my grandparents, right. Who are in their eighties, then my advice would be find joy every day in everything you do because if you have joy if you want to get up every morning then you will you know like i mean yes illness comes but when it comes to aging i mean i've been doing a lot of reading about aging in the past couple of years having a purpose having a reason to get up even if it's that you walk down the hall of your home to meet with those four other guys and play bridge for an hour and that's your thing then do that have a thing that brings you some joy every day that gets you up out of the chair that gets you with your walker or cane or wheelchair and gets you to human interaction for grandparents like for instance my parents i would say um there's a lot i mean these are the baby boomers i think they're such an interesting and complex generation um who've been through such a wide variety of upbringings i find as well and i think for a lot of them they're sandwiched between these very independent millennials and these silent generation 80 90 year olds who need them a lot and i think for boomers i think it's really important that they don't forget to take care of themselves um, because they're going to be the largest population of aging people that we're going to have to help through that, what could be very long last third of their life. Um, and so I want them to take care of themselves. Stop worrying about your millennial children for a minute and, you know, go for a nice walk, <laughs> have your brother or sister look after mom tomorrow so that you can go, you know, get a massage or something like take care of your body, take care of yourself so that you can actually help both these generations that you're sandwiched between right now for 30 somethings my age. That's hard. I mean, I'm going to have to, I, yeah, that's a hard one. I don't know what I would say to someone my own age. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I know what I would say to myself as a 34 year old. So let me do that. I would say don't get trapped in the roles that society has said you should have. So don't get trapped being a wife. Don't get trapped being a mom. Don't get trapped being the firstborn child. Don't get trapped being the um, the organizer for all the family. I have way too much. Um, don't get trapped in these in these roles that either 
others have set for you, that society has set for you, or that you've set for yourself. Allow yourself to be adaptable. Allow yourself to still grow. If you are, like I am, a married mid-30s parent, that doesn't mean that the next 20 years of your life are defined. You can pick up your kid and go live in China for a year if you want to, um, or you can happily stay in your little suburban town, but do what is really going to be interesting and make you thrive and don't get trapped in what other people think you should do. And then for teens, I would tell them to throw away their phones. I mean, that would be, I think, the first thing I'd tell them to do. Um, I would tell them or to take an hour where they don't have any device on their physical human body. Um, and that does not mean that you watch TV for that hour. It just doesn't count. Um, I really worry, like really worry about the younger generations and technology. Um, it is a battle to keep technology away from my daughter. And we don't, she doesn't have an iPad. I'm pretty sure the majority of her five-year-old friends do have their own iPad. How long am I going to be able to control that? It won't be very long. And I look at teenagers, like young teenagers walking down the streets with their group of friends, right? Such an important time to develop social skills in your teens, also to form friendships through the you know, turmoil that is puberty. And and they're just walking and staring at their phones. And oh my God, I'm just, I'm not looking forward to them being adults. I don't know what that's going to look like. And I wish there was a way to get them to realize that if they're going to survive and thrive and, and be humans, like really what fundamentally, fundamentally makes us humans, they need to put away the device and see what that's like to walk down the street and talk to your friend instead of texting them till two in the morning. I don't, and I know I sound really old when I say this, Lacey, I sound like an old mom, but man, I'm, I'm shocked at how much it's taken over that generation. Well, I'm, I'm excited to, to say, first of all, thank you very much for all that advice. I think that's really, really good. Um, I was just going to say like, the, the goal of this show um, was not just to keep interviewing people my age all the time. Mm -hmm. I actually have interviewed one uh, elder, one person over the age of uh, 60. Mm -hmm. And in a couple of days, I'm scheduled to interview my first teenager for the show. Oh, and exciting. I have a different question. So some, like, some of the questions are similarly themed, but I have a different mm -hmm. question set for them. And one of them is about the technology part because I'm yeah. curious to hear what the what the youth think about the technology. So, yeah. um, and I'm hoping that that will lead to then uh, you know other episodes where I get to interview mm -hmm. other different youth. So um, that could be something very interesting if it if it does uh, pan out that you you could look forward to. I guess. <laughs> well, I hope so. I can't wait to see that. I'd be really interested to see how a teenager answers a lot of these questions, which are very. Um, well, they take a lot of self-reflection, the questions you're asking. So I think it'll be interesting to see how they interpret them and, how, and what sort of answers they give. Yeah, the, the questions that I've set for them, like they have been tailored more mm -hmm. to like, I, yeah, because I, I think this would be very like overwhelming and, and kind yeah. of, uh, <laughs> some intense. of them, yeah. and the, the way that this show evolved too, uh, some of the listeners, uh, like longtime listeners will know this, that um, I, I have refined the question set over time because I found that certain questions maybe were always getting the same answer. So it felt like right. it wasn't valuable or some yeah. of them, I just felt like, okay, this is just not really getting good answers. So mm -hmm. um, I feel like the ones that are still in the show are the ones that I feel like still get valuable answers. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, as I, as I do the, the first uh, teen interview, um, I'm sure after that, I'll be like, hey, this question didn't work or this one, yeah. I have to rephrase it or change the mm -hmm. context, but um, I'll, I'll get there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, and of course, I also hope to interview more more elders uh, in time as well. But um, mm -hmm. so now is the time where I flip the script briefly and I like to let the guests have an opportunity to put me on the hot seat. So <gasps> here's where you get a chance to ask <laughs> me a question. From your list of questions, the one that really stood out to me had to do with self-care and especially during this time of a pandemic where, as you said, those traditional views of what self-care are, right? Like going to a spa or getting a manicure or, you know, going to a sports bar to watch a game, like whatever it is, whatever your thing is that gives you this calm and this peace. Um, that's, we've had to sort of really change what that is. So I'm curious what your, like in this year of this pandemic, like how have you taken care of you, Lacey? 
Um, absolutely. Most recently, um, like something that I used to do a lot of, uh, cause like I do spend a lot of time on the computer. I just can't really mm -hmm. avoid it between my job and this and other projects mm -hmm. and things I do. And so like when I, when my brain kind of gets like screen fried, I used to like to go window shopping, like just go to a store, even if I don't buy anything, but just kind of browse mm -hmm. and just kind of be like, Oh, you know, maybe just some, it just kind of gets my brain off of yeah. that. And it, it's a change of scenery and it, and that just kind of helps sometimes or like going for a bike ride. But sometimes I struggle, like right now I can't do window shopping for obvious reasons right. here, here <laughs> as of the time of this recording, we are still in lockdown in Ontario frustratingly. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But so I've been having to like, knowing that I just need that like mental change of scenery and that, that I, I've been like, okay, so what can I do? Cause sometimes like, well, I could go for a bike ride, but I don't want to go. Sometimes I don't want to just, do that sort of thing just for the sake of it. Like I want right. to have like a goal or a destination or a purpose. Mm -hmm. But what I have been finding has been pretty consistently working is uh, having phone calls with friends um, mm -hmm. because a lot of friends are still not comfortable with getting together in person, but right. obviously there's no danger of getting COVID over the phone. So, yep. <laughs> um, and, and like, yeah, we were different people are struggling with different things. So sometimes just being on the phone for an hour and like, I tell them what, what mm -hmm. I'm kind of moping about and they tell me what they're moping about and we both end up feeling better. And it, it, it kind of, yeah. again, it's that mental change of scenery as I'll just go like, kind of do a little walk around the side streets or something while I'm talking or, mm -hmm. um, or sometimes even just lay in bed here and just kind of stare at the ceiling while I talk. And that has that has, has kind of taken the place for now of like window shopping and mm -hmm. accomplishes a similar purpose. And it allows me to have that connection that is otherwise very difficult to achieve right now. So mm -hmm. that's the, the most prominent thing that comes to mind. But otherwise, I would, I would kind of say that with the mental health thing, I've observed a pattern in myself uh, over, over kind of the last few years that when my mental health is suffering, my diet really suffers. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems counterintuitive that you think, okay, I don't feel well, I should eat better because that will help me feel better. But it's like, no, all I when I feel crappy, all I want is cookies and cereal and chips yeah. and, uh, and just like, so <laughs> um, and like chocolate and and but when I'm actually in a better place, somehow, mm -hmm. then I'm like, okay, yes, now I'm willing and I'm actually like, excited to cook mm -hmm. food or at least eat something that I know is actually like better for me. And mm -hmm. so that's like, there's a couple of those sorts of things like music is, you know, something that's obviously important to you as, as a, or has been. And mm -hmm. I've noticed that's another telltale sign for me that like, I don't really casually listen to music very much anymore. But when I like, when I'm in a really good mood, I want to listen to music and you'd think it'd be the yeah. other way around. If I'm not in a good mood, I should listen to music to feel better, but I don't want to. But when I am in a good mm -hmm. mood, I'm like, I want to rock out now. <laughs> and so it's, it's kind of like, I, I seem to end up like punishing myself when I'm not in a good place, whereas mm -hmm. I should be actually. And so the phone calls have also been helping because even just like, you know, half an hour on the phone or 15 minutes on the phone with somebody can give me that boost and then I'm like okay now I want to go and eat something healthier now I want to go and like listen to music and work on something and um so yeah that's really my primary form of like kind of self-care and and like uh, therapy right now hmm. and do you do like regular like old school phone calls or do you facetime um they've mostly been just like old school just voice yeah. calls um but I I have done I think I've done one or two video calls with people yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's just about the real time, like conversation mm -hmm. and hearing mm -hmm. a voice. Cause like sometimes they're not able or comfortable to be on voice. So we just have to like, you know, type back and forth, which right. is better than yeah. nothing. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, just going for like a walk with my, my, um, noise canceling headphones and just like talking to somebody talking. about life. It, it's, it's something right now. <laughs> That's I know. And I think, you know, the one well, I'm sure there are some good things, but the one good thing I see coming out of COVID is us actually taking steps back, right? Mm -hmm. To just talking on the phone to, you know, you know, oh, I can't, I, oh, I can't come to that. You know, I used to be so worried that I couldn't go to some gathering someone was having and I'd feel so guilty that I couldn't go. And, you know, now it's like, that's okay. You just pick up the phone and like talk to them for a bit and be like, hey, sorry, I can't come. So tell me what's going on since I'm going to miss out on everything. You know, like we, we've taken steps back. Families are doing things outdoors together instead of being indoors, you know, on devices because they're doing that all day. So they're finding these 
these new ways to to be together, to be outdoors. And I hope that that, hope that stays, you know? Like, it is lovely. I've done the same thing, walking and talking. I did that with my friend Catherine, who I mentioned. We've walked and talked together before, both in person and not, right? Depending where we were in Ontario at the time. It's, uh, it's so great. It's so good you've been doing that. It's so therapeutic. Yeah, well, it, it partly started because, uh, like, I'm naturally more introverted, and that doesn't mean I don't like talking to people. But mm -hmm. I, it just means that I um, don't, I didn't have as much need. But between, um, like, because the pandemic has, has like forced me uh, when it, under normal times pre-pandemic, I could choose more or less when I wanted to interact with people, and yeah. now it's like that choice has been taken away from me in in part. So it has made me become a bit more extroverted and mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, well, now it's not necessarily just my choice. It's like, oh, sometimes I want to talk to people and I just can't. And, um, but also like, yeah, I, I went through a breakup a few months ago and um, that was really, really difficult because um, mm -hmm. I'd been extremely emotionally invested in in that situation. And and then to just suddenly have that like gone and, and have this kind of void just that, you know, and sometimes like, we're not all of us speaking of mental health, not all of us are know how to like kind of sit in discomfort. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so like I was, you know, kind of climbing the walls and and just like I I couldn't be alone in my own brain very long. And thankfully that's gotten a lot better. So mm -hmm. Good. um yeah. But that's but good. I think uh that that's something I've talked to a couple of friends about this idea of when we do when things do get opened up again and when we've all had our second vaccine dose or whatever and mm -hmm. like hanging out in person for some people again is going to be weird and we have to learn how to do it again because we're so yeah. used now to it's like well we just talk online all the time yeah i know i know i think uh there was this hilarious i forget who put it out i'm gonna find it and send it to you if you haven't seen it but it was this video i think it came out of like uh either sweden or some country over in europe i remember where people all of a sudden realize they can go back to their normal lives and it's hilarious you see these rant like thousands of couples making out in a park or um like people running into these offices that have overgrown trees through them and stuff and it's just like the idea that human connections finally allowed again and i hope that we kind of as I was talking about with teenagers as well, right? That we, you know, realize, okay, we've done enough of the technology for the past year, year and a half to, for a lifetime. We're good now. Let's just like put them down and, you know, drive to your friend's house to talk to her instead of, you know, calling her on the phone if you can, right? I hope that that, that stays, that we don't just go back to our old ways necessarily. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. So... Uh, now we're going to kind of round out the show here. Um, I like to ask the guests, give them an opportunity um, on every episode on the YouTube portion. I do have a dedicated Black Lives Matter button and we do the land acknowledgement. And of mm -hmm. course, with it being Pride Month as we record this, um, you know, we very much support trans rights and like everybody, all, everyone under the umbrella. I, I actually do identify with several of those things. I don't want to list out the whole thing, but I'd like to give each episode the, the guest an opportunity um, are there any specific charities or causes that you would like to promote or raise awareness of? Sure. It's kind of perfect timing. I, I sit on the board of the Healing Cycle Foundation, and we raise money to help support hospice and palliative care centers in Ontario. And so we're in like full promotion mode right now for our ride that happens in September. Um, it used to be that we had a day where we all get together and ride our bikes. You can also walk or run or um, that's totally fine as well. Um, but we're still going to keep it virtual this year because not, we're not going to have enough people fully vaccinated come September, right? So it's going over four months. You can ride, you can raise money, um, and and a hundred percent of these proceeds are going to go to hospice and palliative care centers. And what people don't realize is the funding that the government gives covers fifty one percent of an operational bu budget. So these hospices who are working their little butts off to provide an immense amount of support to people who are near their end of life as well as their families also have to come up with 49% of their operating budget every year. And so that's where we come in. We want to get as much money in their pockets as possible so they can continue doing the remarkable work that they do. So if you have any interest in all at all, please go to the healingcycle.ca. Um, you can also find me online and I'll happily give you info but yeah, that's who I would like to plug today because they do some, we do some really amazing work and I want to be able to help as many of these centers as we can. 
That is so great to hear. And thank you for sharing that. I will definitely put that up on the screen and it it always gets included in the show notes as well um, for both for the podcast audience and for the uh, video audience. Um, Try to make sure that everyone is, is covered if I can help Mm it Um, as uh, yeah. And so the the next actually leading into that uh, is the plug section. And I always let the uh, guests go first. So any uh, online presence or, Anything that you want people to know about, to where to find you, or anyone, anything like that, um, it's your your platform. Yeah, sure. So you can check out uh, my company at www.viveplanning.ca. Vive is with two eyes, V I I V E, and then you can follow us on any of the social medias. Um, I believe on I don't run social media. So many I believe on Instagram and Twitter we're at Vive Planning. Um, you can find us on Facebook as well, and then you can find us on LinkedIn. But you're also welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn as well. If you have any follow up questions from today, I encourage you to find me there. Um, it's just under my name, Mallory McGrath. Uh, Yeah. So any info you have about the company or me, you're welcome to find me there. Yeah, very cool. I I don't think we are connected on LinkedIn yet. So I will have to. Oh, we should rectify that. that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, yeah, so for mine, I, I try to keep it so like I do so many things. So I try to, uh, mm-hmm. my, well, you can find this show, uh, hatcollecting.com at hatcollecting on social media. We're only on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook right now because I have to do all of that and I, I don't have 10 arms, unfortunately. Oh, I know. This is why uh, I found someone to do it for me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, as for myself, uh, you can find me at artemiscreates.com and there you can find my book, my music, my design and merch. Um, by Twitch, like all the different things that I do. And I put a, I'll put up an overlay on the screen uh, just briefly to kind of show everything because there's there's a lot of places that I'm at. I don't post frequently on all of them, but uh, I'm there. And uh, yeah, at the end of the show, there's, there's a little bit more like sort of more of the charities and things that have come up and things. Um, and yeah, if you um, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, if you want to like and subscribe uh, that would be really helpful supports the channel and uh, you'll know when the next video comes out and if Mm -hmm. you're listening to this on the podcast uh, if you go to itunes or whatever thing you're using if it allows for you know liking and leaving reviews that also helps uh, boost the show and help people find us so um, that's all appreciated Uh, and that said oh yeah and the fan interaction part um, thank goodness i have notes (laughs) Um, yeah, if you are so inclined, um, if you're watching this on YouTube, um, please do leave a comment, uh, your favorite thing mm-hmm. that you learned or uh, your favorite part from the show or questions, comments, anything like that. Um, just leave a comment and let us hear from you. And I appreciate that. But yeah, so now we come to the the actual like uh, fun little ending tradition here. I call it the, the hat sign off. We each have a hat. And um I don't know if uh, did you want to do yours first? You want to do it at the same time? How do you how do you do it at the same time? So we have a reveal together. I like that. (laughs) Okay. Do you you want to count us in? I'll count you in. Ready? One, two, three. Because today's theme is yellow, so yes, that's great. I'm so glad you did. I I got this hat at the what's it called? The hat the oh beau chapeau in Niagara on the Lake. It's my like summer cute hat. Yeah, I like nice. it. I like your hard hat because you're working hard. You're getting a lot done today. <laughs> yeah, I I uh, have uh, at least one hat and I think all the main colors. I think I only this is like the only like yellow one that I have. And then I have <laughs> one that um, I'm saving for a specific kind of guest if uh, if I ever end up having them because it'll be perfect for that. Um uh-huh. But, but yeah, that's, uh, that is what I like to, again, I didn't want this to become a gimmick, which is why we just do it right at the end, but mm-hmm. it's a fun little thing that ties into the name yeah. of the show and gives us a, yeah. a cute little screenshot. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, thank you so much for joining the show. We've had a really great conversation. I'm going to have a bit of editing mm-hmm. to do, but I think it'll be more than <laughs> worth it. <laughs> great. Yeah. yeah, it was really wonderful to be here. I think the whole concept makes so much sense. And I think it's important for us to see people as people, see them just as equals, but yet diverse in, in all of their, their their differences and whatnot. But someone you could hang out with, have a glass of wine with or a cup of tea. And, and I think that this podcast really helps with that. 
Yes, I, I appreciate that endorsement. Um, <laughs> so, so that said, um, to, to prevent this getting too much longer, I, I would love to just keep talking, honestly, but I have to be disciplined. So um, thank you to everyone for watching and listening. And uh, until the next time, until the next hat collecting or the next fascinator, um, stay curious and keep collecting those hats.